What's up, you guys? Teller checking in for UFC Vegas 96. Uh, first and foremost, I do apologize for being a little late to the party. You guys know I like to have these videos up as soon as possible, as early as Sunday. Uh, right after we're done with one card, I like to have these videos up and running. So I apologize getting this one out a little bit later. I guess the, the hangover uh, from UFC 305 was real. Uh, if you guys caught me on the fight campaign, I was going absolutely berserk. I think I scared a couple of you guys away. Uh, but you have to know I had a lot on the line for that DDP play. And I was enjoying myself. So uh, hopefully you're not one of the ones that I scared away. Most likely you're not because you're here. I hope you guys cashed on the free official play that we posted here on the channel on Drekus du Plessis. Uh, that was uh, not just your your uh, average free play, right? I mean, that was an underdog target. He was out there at even odds. He was a plus 130 uh, a little bit before I posted that video. You guys know I was on him from the beginning. I hope you guys tailed me there. And uh, you guys can expect to see those free official plays come out periodically. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel here. All right, guys. So I'm going to make this video sharp and concise for you guys. I'll let you know where I stand. We have a, a good amount of heavy favorites scattered throughout this card. It's a lower uh, level UFC fight card. There's no question about that. But there's definitely spots to make some money. If you guys are interested in my official plays, reach out to me. And I'll give you further information there. Shoot me an email, DM me on Instagram or Twitter. Go follow me while you're over there. And last thing before we jump into the first fight, just note we are powered by BetUS. Sign up through the link in the description of this video and you will get a 125% match in your first three deposits. Nobody's giving those kind of matches. Okay, as far as the sports books go, nobody is giving those types of deposit matches. So note that. Let me know if you sign up so I can give you an additional gift as well. All right, guys, I'm not going to hold this up anymore. Let's jump right into the first fight. The Teller. The Teller. The Teller. The Teller. The Teller. What a fight to kick the card off in the women's flyweight division. We have the biggest favorite of the card in Kong Wang. She's taking on Victoria Leonardo. If you're not familiar with Kong Wang, uh, just had a victory on the road to UFC, but she's most notable for her victory over Valentina Shevchenko uh, over in the kickboxing world. Okay, so a very smooth striker. There's no question about that. Been watching some of her MMA fights. She uh, translates that, that kickboxing background that she has right into the cage. She's very comfortable there. Actually uh, has a couple submission victories as well. I do think that she has... Uh, some some promise. I think that she potentially could make some noise in the UFC. I still need to see more from her, though. Uh, she only has five professional fights, 5-0, and oh, uh, fighting lower-level opponents, to say the least. Uh, the only recognizable name that you're really going to see there is uh, Yanin Wu. If you guys remember uh, Yanin Wu or Wu Yanin, uh, she fought in the UFC. She ended her UFC career going like 0-4 and, and uh, pulled off like one little tricky submission in the octagon. Uh, but just... Not a high-level opponent, even though she's fought in the UFC. Not a high-level opponent. Uh, she comes off a submission victory over Paula Luna, the Peruvian fighter there. Uh, we talked about some of the the different elements that she's showing, you know, sh showing that she's working on her grappling. That was that last fight on the road to UFC. So, uh, listen, she's a huge favorite. Like I said, we're going to get to the line here in a second. Uh, I think that this is a step up in competition to an extent. I mean, this is Victoria Leonardo. I'm not high on her at all. Uh, I mean, she is a, a meat and potato meal that was frozen, packaged up, and put in the refrigerator at your local Walmart. Okay, that's the type of meal that she's putting on the plate on the on the platter for you. Okay, on the other hand, Kong Wang is is a spicy, spicy tuna roll, but you don't know how long that meat's been sitting out. You know what I mean? It could potentially spoil you. Uh, I mean, at least for for where the line's at, if you guys know what I'm saying. I don't think it's worth chalking up a minus 1,100 on a women's flyweight bout. Uh, Victoria Leonardo, like I said, that I like to use that reference, that meat and potato reference. She's very basic. Okay, She's kind of evenly well-rounded as a fighter, but very low level in all aspects. I think that Kong Wang's probably going to tee off on her, and we're going to see something similar to what we've seen in some of Leonardo's uh major defeats before where she's been knocked out against high-level fighters like Natalia Silva and Manon Farot and Melissa Gatto. And Gatto is not even on the same level as a Natalia Silva and a, and a Manon Farot, but still a good fighter. And when Leonardo gets matched up against high-level fighters, she tends to fold. And she can go out there and defeat a girl like Chelsea Hackett on DWCS or go out there and defeat a Mandy Bone. But those are very low-level fighters. And, and when you kind of understand that she's losing to very high level fighters and then uh, she's defeating very low level fighters you kind of can't completely put your finger on victoria Leonardo. so 
it's not worth coughing up the odds, guys. Okay, let me just cut to the chase here. Minus 1,100, it's crazy. That's one of the highest favorites that we've seen in a while. Uh, it's a similar line to what we just saw from Tom Nolan uh, against Reyes. Wasn't that interesting? And for all of you guys, now you see why I'm telling you not to target those kind of lines. You, you may say, uh, for some of you you newer betters, uh, you may say, oh, but why? I cashed. I, I, I cashed on Tom Nolan. You know, you play it over the long haul, you're going to lose in those types of plays. Those upsets periodically will happen. And that Tom Nolan fight played out a lot closer than a lot of you guys thought that it was. And look at the ticket you were holding in your hand to win just a couple pennies there. So I'm staying away from this. Another women's bout here. Uh, we're bumping up a weight class to the bantamweight division. Jose Ann Nunez taking on Jacqueline Cavalcanti. Uh, Jacqueline uh, Cavalcanti looked pretty damn good in her UFC debut. Uh, she got that victory over Zara Farin, which is not a high-level opponent, but... I just like the way that Jacqueline looked out there. I think that she really showed that she's a high caliber striker and she's figuring out uh, the, the, the whole game. And I, I think that she has a lot of promise, especially when you take into consideration she's just 26 years old, uh, has some experience fighting over in the PFL before she worked her way into the UFC. I think this is a girl that you got to keep an eye on here. Uh, while on the other hand, uh, Jocelyn Nunez is a girl that I've backed before. And in fact, I backed her in her last fight against Chelsea Chandler and that bit me. That was a fight that she should have been able to take. And she showed once again that her size can play a factor in her fights. She's very undersized, even though she has some good pop in her hands and she's an above average striker. She's undersized against all these girls. She has low level grappling. And I think that we're actually starting to see who she is as a fighter uh, over time. You know, I was a little bit more high on her. Uh, especially compared to where I'm at with her right now, okay? Because I'm disappointed in in her, and maybe I'm a little biased from my pick here, just remembering and rewatching a little bit of tape of that Chandler fight and how how, how annoying it was how, how that fight played out. She's three and one in the UFC, but all four of her fights essentially fighting lower level fighters. Okay, I mean, I don't want to go into my girl Chandler. You guys know I, I like my girl Chandler there, but uh, all four of the fighters that she's faced off against Ramona Pasquale. Uh, Bea Malecki. I mean, these are just low-level fighters. And I think that Cavacante is definitely going to prove to be a fighter that uh, reached way higher heights than any of those fighters that we just mentioned. I, I like Jacqueline Cavacante, uh, Cavacante here. Uh, you take a look at the line movement here. We're, we're on BetUS. This is a line that opened up at minus 170. At one point in time, it did, uh, interestingly enough, touch 160. It kind of went the other way, but now it's completely down uh, the opposite direction. She's a minus 200. She's a 2-1 to favorite. I think that Cavacante will get the better of the striking exchanges. She'll use her length uh, to her advantage. And even as things get ugly and they're in the clinch or whatnot, I think Cavacante will prove just to be the better fighter. And if we see this fight go down to the mat, I expect Cavacante to be the fighter that's getting the better even there. Uh, even though that she's not the most proven fighter uh, down on the mat, she has to show more to us. But I still think she'll be better than Jose and Nunez. I have major concerns uh, with, with Nunez's grappling. So I, I like Cavacante. This is a fight that you could sit back and say, oh, two to one odds on a women's fight like this. You know, uh, Nunez has some pop in her hands. Maybe it plays out closely. My instincts are kind of telling me that Calvacante just starts to grow as a fighter. 26 years old starts to really grow and really prove to be something pretty good and goes out there and, and handles this fight. I could even see this fight being like a 30 27 Calvacante. So I'm not necessarily opposed to even the two to one odds on her. Two Dana White's Contender Series alum here. Although they had very different experiences on the show, even though they both got contracts. Jose Medina got the contract for being the best punching bag that we've ever seen on the show, right? Based off his toughness is why he got the contract. Because if you remember, he got absolutely beaten down uh, by Magomed uh, Gachiasulov, who, even though Gachiasulov had a slow start to his last fight in the octagon, finished that fight strongly. And I think that he's not a bad fighter, but still, Gachiasulov just absolutely put a beating uh, on the Bolivian Jose Medina. Now, Jose Medina, yeah, he may be tough, but, I mean, what does he really bring to the table offensively? Um, he's coming down in weight. That fight that we were just talking about took place in the light heavyweight division. He's now fighting in the middleweight division, which is, I think, a plus for him based off his, his physique up there. Um, Zachary Reese had an atrocious UFC debut. It was kind of similar to Tom Nolan, who we talked about earlier. They, they fell flat on their face, quite literally, in their UFC debuts, but great bounce-back fights for both of them. Zachary Reese showed the potential that he has uh, in his last fight. Went out there, finished Julian Marquez within 20 seconds. Uh, the uppercut 
uh, to the, the then hammer fist. That was a fight that really had me pumped up. You guys know I'm not the biggest Marquez fan. If you guys, uh, well, not, a, not a big story there, but I just never was a big Marquez fan. He had me on his Instagram live once. He kind of has a cocky attitude. And uh, it was kind of fun for me to watch him get put out there. But uh, besides that, I just, I like to see Zachary Reese live up to, to some of the potential that he has because he's uh, a freakish fighter for the division, a great frame, big fight ending power in his hands, uh, nasty jujitsu skills as well. He's a well-rounded fighter. Uh, the question mark we have in regards to him, of course, is his chin. Now, Jose Medina, even though he has uh, just under half of his finishes coming by way of knockout, when I watch tape on him, not really overly concerned with his his offense. I think that Reese can avoid being clipped with, the, with the, an upsetting type shot. And I think that it's Zachary Reese that's going to find the finish here. Medina's never been finished. I understand that. And he showed how durable he, he was. But now he's dropping down in weight. Okay. Has a little bit more of a weight cut going on here. And I just think that if you're going to be a fighter that just tries to live off your toughness, walking through shots and whatnot, you're going to occasionally come through. Uh, you're going to meet some guys like Zachary Reese that have some nasty fight ending power. And I think that. I think Zachary Reese is live for the knockout. I'm taking Zach Reese to get an earlier knockout in this fight. He brings it, and I think that he, Medina will be there to be hit, and Reese will find those opportunities to get him out of there. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how tough Medina is, but at the very least, I got Reese winning this fight. Uh, Reese opened up as a minus 400. He's now a minus 600. Big action coming into him. Another steep favorite on this card. Um, you know, If you caught him at minus 400 or 500, I think that you could uh, potentially put have put him in a parlay. He may have not went wrong there, a two-teamer or something like that. It's just it's getting up there, man. This is a fight that you want to be looking at. Maybe a, a KO finish for Reese if you can get some good value there. Maybe people just believe that Medina is, is so tough. He's never been knocked out, so you can actually get a bargain line there. Try to shop a KO prop on Reese. Uh, maybe an under or something like that, or maybe you just bite the bullet and still parlay Reese even at these high odds. But I think Reese is going to prove to be the superior fighter, and I think that Zach Reese is going to be a fighter that proves to be a major threat in this division uh, over time. To the lightweight division, we have an interesting betting line for this fight, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, but besides just the, the betting aspect of the fight, I think that this is one of the fights on paper that will really deliver. This will be one of the more fun fights on the card. Uh, these fighters definitely have holes in their game, but they do bring it. Uh, Slava Borishev, Slava Klaus uh, coming off a loss to Chase Hooper. And if you're looking at that fight and you're saying, oh, well, he got submitted by Chase Hooper. Hooper is very high, a ha very high level grappler. Do not forget that Chase Hooper hurt him standing. Okay. He clipped him and dropped him early in that fight. Okay. Uh, besides that, he was hurt very badly in the fight before that against Nazim Sadyakov, a fighter that I'm high on. But Borishev is supposed to be this high level striker, which I know he is offensively, but he's eating shots on the feet. Okay. All right, we already know that he has major deficiencies with his grappling and takedown defense. We saw that against Mark Casey and Mike Davis. Uh, you know, bounced back with a big knockout victory after those two losses, showing the knockout power that we knew that he had since his performance on Dana White's Contender Series, where he starched Chris Duncan, or then eventually knocked out Dakota Bush in his UFC debut. We understand offensively he's a very dangerous fighter, but major question marks in regards to his takedown defense and grappling. And I would even say now question marks in regards to his, his defensive striking. Okay. On the other hand, James Lontop doesn't check off a lot of boxes, but there are a few boxes that he checks off that I like. And it's his, uh, his cardio. This is a guy that could really push, push late in fights. I think he's a tough dude. Uh, didn't have a good UFC debut to say the least. He got finished up there by Chris Padilla via submission in the first round. Chris Padilla may end up proving to be a better fighter than any of us really knew. I think that Chris may have even took that fight on short notice. We didn't really know a lot about him, but maybe he's not that bad of a fighter. Um, and I would say that was a learning experience for James Lontop. He's only 25 years old. I think his ceiling is actually a lot higher than a, than a Slava Klaus because we know who Slava Klaus is. Slava Klaus is already up there in age. Okay. And at 32 years old, even training with Uriah Faber and all them over at team alpha male, he's never going to fix his takedown defense enough to really make any type of noise in this division. I'm not saying James Lontop will either, but maybe he does. He's 25 years old. Maybe he cleans up some things. Um, I like the reach advantage he has here. I would not be shocked if he ends up hurting Slava Klaus in a war, even though it's more likely that Slava Klaus gets that KO on the feet and the matchup kind of favors Slava based on the fact that they probably will strike it out and Slava Klaus is, is dangerous offensively, but this is a target where I can go in on the dog. I'm not, there's not a lot of opportunities in this card to target dogs. I know you guys want your occasional dogs through these cards. Give me James Law on top. I think that this fight can get ugly. I think that we could see a little bit of back and forth, and I think Lontop can potentially hurt Slava there. I like the the cardio and the heart that he has to push late in, in this fight, and I can't back 
Slava Klaus as as much of a favorite as he is here as reaching on some of these books at like as high as a minus 250. James Lontop right now, he was a plus uh, 200, 220. Right now he's a plus 195. He's still a two to one underdog. I think the value is definitely on Lontop and I think that he could potentially find a finish in this fight. Value is on James Lontop to bounce back with the victory, if you ask me. In the featherweight division, another fight that should be an absolute barn burner, but has a questionable betting line next to it. Uh, once again here, Dennis Bazukia taking on Danny Silva. Danny Silva is an absolute junkyard dog. You see that term thrown around uh, periodically on the internet. I mean, it's so fitting for Danny Silva. He's a junkyard dog. He showed that to us on Dana White's Contender Series uh, where he got the victory over Angel Pacheco. Both fighters are extremely tough, but it was Danny Silva that was showing to be the more refined boxer. I think his boxing is very good. He is there to be hit a little bit at times. We've seen him eat some shots. He kind of relies on his toughness, kind of march you down and land on you. Uh, luckily, his chin has proven to be absolute granite. Uh, thus far, uh, he's never been finished. Has one decision, lost there. Uh, on the other hand, Dennis Bazukia is a fighter that's 12 and four. Uh, he's, he's very young, still has a lot of room to grow as a fighter. He's had a rough start uh, to, to uh, his career working with the UFC. If you guys remember, um, had a victory. Or excuse me, took a loss first and foremost against Melsic back to He was very young at the time, 22 years old. Uh, went on quite a winning streak. Uh, fighting over at Ring of Combat, which he eventually got another opportunity to fight on Dana White's Contender Series. He decisioned Kelly o. Romero, still didn't get signed by the UFC, fought over at UAE Warriors, fought over at CFFC. He was on a nice little win streak and then got another opportunity to fight under that UFC banner. Took two losses in a row, but look at the level of competition. I'm high on both Sean Woodson and Jamal Emers. And he even took, uh, I think it was the Woodson fight. It took on short notice, so give him give him a break there. I think it was the Woodson fight. I forget if it was the Emmers or Woodson, but did take a fight on short notice. Um, but then, you know, he eventually figures it out against Connor Matthews. He's showing his potential. He has above average power in his hands. He has wrestling ability. He's not a bad fighter. He has plenty of time to take his, his skill level to a whole nother level. We'll see how he looks on the night. All in all, I do like Danny Silva. I just not turning my back on Danny Silva. He just cashed in. Uh, for an official player of mine. I think he's a dog. I like who he surrounds himself with, with Cub Swanson and all those dogs over there. Um, but as we get to the betting line here, this line doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, Dennis Bazooka is uh, over, or right now he's, he's a plus 190. He was a plus 200. Another two to one underdog in a fight that could play out very closely. Uh, maybe we see Danny Silva rely a little bit too much on his toughness and his chin here and he can get knocked out by Bazooka. Uh, I just think that Bazookia can keep this fight close potentially as well. The value is on Dennis. I am going to pick Danny Silva to win the fight. I'm going to say he wins the decision, just landing a little bit of the cleaner boxing. And how he has the takedown defense and all that to make to, to potentially have success as well. But I want to be very clear. I would not cough up anywhere from two and a half uh, to, to one type of odds on him there. He was a minus 265. That's that's blasphemy. It's coming down a little bit, minus 230. If anything, maybe if Silva dropped all the way down to like a minus 170, that's where I'd be targeting him. I literally have him targeted as like, uh, I have him capped at right around a minus 175. So the line is off, but I'll tip my hat to Danny Silva, man. He's came through for me before. I'll say he wins the fight and what what should be a war. In the middleweight division, we have Edmund Shabazi and taking on Gerald Mearshart. Uh, Gerald Mearshart, an absolute dog as well. This is a fighter that has big time accolades as far as the submissions that he's pulled off in the UFC. Uh, he's willing to go to war with you. He'll drag you into those deep waters and he'll try to uh, snatch up a sub as the fight progresses. Uh, offensively with his striking, he's technically okay. He just moves very slow and he's there to be hit. We can never forget what comes that Shemayev did to him. That was a crazy, crazy fight where he was knocked out early on. I truly believe he is there to be hit. Edmund Shabazian is a much quicker striker. Um, he's a well, very well-rounded fighter as well. I think that Edmund Shabazian has the jiu-jitsu to avoid being subbed uh, by Gerald Mearshart. He's never been submitted in his career thus far. He's a fighter that uh, grew up uh, participating in a lot of the, the Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, scenes over there in California. Everybody was raving about what he was doing over there. And I really do believe that he can avoid being subbed by Gerald Mearshart. I think he gets the better uh, of the striking here. Like I said, he's a quicker fighter. Gerald will be there to be hit. And I can see Edmund Shabazian actually getting a knockout in this fight. 10 of Edmund's 13 victories have come by way of knockout. Okay, he is a finisher uh, with his strikes. And he's only 26 years old. All right, that's pretty crazy if you think about that. Just 26 years old, he had a very early start to his UFC career. And although he was on quite 
a, a losing streak and all that. Look at the level of competition, man. This dude was, this kid was thrown to the wolves from a very uh, young age, right? So after getting signed after his Dana White's Contender Series fight, uh, he fought Darren Stewart, who was, who was a tough dude back in the day. Uh, Charles Bird, okay, not that those are the biggest names, but then take a look. Um, well, we'll pass up Jack Marshman as well. Then we bump up. A more primed Brad Tavares, which he got the knockout there in the first round. That was before anybody was knocking Brad Tavares out. That was a, a much better version of Tavares. This is where the losing streak starts to kind of happen. Lost to a Derek Brunson, a blonde-haired Derek Brunson, a Jack Hermanson. Come on, man. You guys know Hermanson's a problem. Nazaruddin Amavov, who's looking to make a run at the title right now. If he could defeat Brendan Allen, he's not that far away. Uh, he bounced back with a knockout victory over Dolce, and then he loses to Anthony Hernandez. Anthony Hernandez, one of the sleepers of this division. So very high-level losses. And then he goes out there and knocks out AJ Dobson the first round, showing that he can go out there, like I said, and knock you out. Gerald Mearshart will, there, will be there to be hit. And I think Edmund Shabazian gets him out of there. I think he finishes him. Uh, he'll get a TKO in this fight. Uh, Edmund opened up as a minus 260. Came down to a minus 330. He's now minus 280. Another heavy favorite. I'm not too interested in the dog value on Gerald Mearshart. Uh, I'm just not. I just think that he's he's getting up there in age. He's a, he's a lethargic type of fighter. And Edmund Shabazian isn't Brian Barbarena. Okay, I know Gerald comes off that Brian Barbarena win. This isn't a Brian Barbarena type matchup. Okay, Edmund Shabazian has the jujitsu to avoid that type of fight or to, he, to avoid being subbed and he should get the better of Mearshart. TKO for Shabazian. On a card filled with heavy favorites, this is the second biggest favorite uh, on the night and Michael Morales, just 25 years old, one of the true young promising prospects uh, making noise in the octagon. He's taken on one of the proven veterans uh, of the game and Neil Magny, who's currently ranked number 12 in the division. Uh, Neil Magny still making noise, man, up there in age, but just had a massive upset over Mike Malott. Finished him in the third round with 15 seconds left in a fight he was in route to losing. Uh, you take a look at his losses, high-level losses. Lost to Ian Gary, as of recently, Gilbert Burns, Shavkat Rachmanov. Uh, and in between that, getting victories over high-level fighters still, like Jeff Neal, Max Griffin, uh, Daniel Rodriguez, and Phil Rowe. Uh, we talked about the Mike Malott fight. I mean, he definitely has still more to offer the fight game, even at 37 years old. Uh, kind of reminds me of a fighter that we'll be talking about in a little bit in Angela Hill. Just a fighter that's still having a lot of success up in age. A well-rounded fighter, a crafty fighter. Let's cut to the chase here, though. I'm very high on Michael Morales. This is a fighter that has real wrestling to, to back up his striking skills. He's very well-rounded. Uh, he's a nasty striker. He's going to be better everywhere this fight goes. The only avenue for victory, in my opinion, for Neil Magny is to do something similar to what he did in his last fight. Make it kind of an ugly fight and, and out cardio Morales somehow in the third round and put him in a vulnerable position. I don't see that being the case. I think Michael Morales goes to 17-0, and 0, which at just 25 years old in this division, I think he's kind of going under the radar. There's been a couple other fighters we've been talking about as of recently to that, that are looking to to make some noise up towards the top 10 and towards running towards a title. Michael Morales is going to really start to be spoken uh, about after this victory over Neil Magny, especially if he goes out there and gets a knockout, which I do think he, he can find a finish in, in this fight. And um, I'll say Morales gets the finish. I'm going to say... I'm going to hope that he he steps it up a little bit uh, more with, uh, offensively and with a little bit more of his aggression because he has fight-ending ability, has big-time boxing skills, comes off two decision victories, but before that, knocked out Trevin Giles and Adam Fugett, uh, and he's had a good amount of knockouts and, and finishes in general uh, throughout his career. Uh, just four decisions out of 16 victories, okay? So, I mean, the vast majority of his fights have been won via finish. I know Neil Magny's a, a step up compared to a lot of those fighters, but... I'm going to say the 25-year-old continues to show growth, and I'm going to say he hurts Magny, an older Magny. So Michael Morales to get a second-round knockout. I'm going to say he catches Magny. Take a look at the line here. Opened up as a minus 600 on BetUS. He's now a minus 850. What do you guys want me to tell you here? Um, what are you going to do with this line, man? If A minus 600 could have thrown it in a two-teamer, potentially, if you had to have action on this fight. But it's one of those fights, man. You kind of got to just sit back and uh, just kind of enjoy it, see how it plays out, in my opinion. So we have the tough finale here uh, in the middleweight division. Ryan Loader taking on Robert Valentin. Uh, both these fighters uh, a little bit up there in age for uh, for them making their their debuts to the UFC, working their way off the show. Uh, specifically with Ryan Loader, thirty three years old, uh, not the most exciting fighter to watch, but does have a wrestling base and can give fighters problems uh, with his wrestling. He's never been finished as well. Shows to be pretty tough. Uh, Robert Valentin, uh, more of a fight finisher. 
has his fair share of submissions and a couple knockouts there. Uh, in fact, he's finished nine of his 10 victories. He's really been a fight finisher. Uh, I've seen him struggle a little bit defensively grappling before, uh, even though he came back and, and got a finish in that one fight I'm talking about. Uh, but I didn't like the fact that he was put on his back early on. And that was the Remco Venden Brink fight where he eventually actually had the knockout in the second round. But early on, uh, he was the one taken down and kind of slammed down uh, on his back. I didn't like that aspect of what I was seeing because I think that loader will close the distance. He'll press and he'll look to make it ugly with the grappling. And I think he could have some early success. It's going to come down to the fact, can Robert Valentin work his way back up to his feet or can he stuff those takedowns and then use his striking to, to tee off, which I do believe he's the, the better striker. Uh, I think that Robert Valentin has a higher ceiling. If things were to work out for either fighter, Robert Valentin could be a fighter that makes a little bit more noise, a little bit more of an exciting fighter. Uh, you know, he has that type of potential. Ryan Loader, uh, I mean, if he wins this fight, gets the contract, I just, I'm not that excited to see him fight. Uh, fight to fight. So I just, I don't know where we go with that, but um, I'll give you a little bit of a curveball though. I, I am going to take Ryan Loader to win this fight. I'm going to say that this fight ends up playing out very ugly. And I'm going to say the wrestling of Loader helps him prevail here and, and win uh, the ultimate fighter here. And uh, I'll take Ryan Loader. He's a plus 130 currently. So I do believe that the value is on him to say the least, but I'm not extremely confident in the pick, but if you're looking at it from a betting aspect, you're getting plus odds there. Um, Ryan Loader is not a small fighter for the division and he's pretty tough. It's never been finished. I'm going to say that he has success with the wrestling gets the job done there. Uh, but yeah, I'll be honest and I hate to say it like this. I hate to be that guy. Cause I used to hate when people would say that man, but the ultimate fighter really lost a lot of, of, of the it factor it once had. And now, you know, Dana White's contender series just completely swallowed that show whole. And I just, I can't believe I'm saying I'm not like overly excited with the tough finale, uh, matchup there. And it is what it is, man. I got to be honest with you guys. Michael Vick here at BetUS.com. Get it all. Huge bonuses, great odds, a race book, live in-game betting, and a casino. BetUS, my online sports book and casino. In the women's strawweight division, Angela Hill, 39 years old, not too far away from 40, still going out there having success, fight to fight, still being very active. It's crazy. It's crazy, man. She's 17 and 13. It's just so funny because we're always talking about her and we're just constantly seeing uh, you know, her, her record change. I just remember always looking at it. It was, it was always buzzing around 500. She had a very uh, early start to her UFC career, right? She jumped right into to the big pond or you know the big ocean. She never really had a lot of experience in the regional scene. She was cut by the UFC for a little bit of time, but fought in Invicta, which, you know, Invicta, uh, the cream of the crop as far as outside of the UFC for women's MMA. And I think she even grabbed the title over there and was winning fights. Uh, but a fighter that was always like a 500 fighter. And now look at her. She's 17 and 13. She's on the other uh, side uh, percentage wise and all fighting the best women fighters in the world. Okay. So you got to tip your hat to her there. Uh, I mean, you take a look at the resume. She's coming off wins over Denise Gomes and Lu Luana Pinero. Those are two younger fighters that are trying to make a name for, them, for themselves, similar to Richie and Hill's shutting that down. Um, the Mackenzie Dern fight, that was a questionable performance by her. I was uh, kind of interested to, for the way that that fight played out. But um, victories over Emily Ducote, that was a great one for her. Uh, Lupi Garines. And then you take a look at the losses, all against high-level opponents. And although I think that she's very, very live to win this fight, I think this fight's kind of a coin flip in my opinion. I like the fact that Tabitha Ritchie's the younger fighter. I like the fact that Tabitha Ritchie should have a little bit of a grappling edge. Maybe she sneaks in some takedowns and works some BJJ. She's very physically fit. Even though she's a smaller fighter, she's very physically fit. I think that she arguably won that Lupi Garinez fight. And I still am high on Garinez, even though she just came up short in a fight that she arguably won against Mackenzie Dern. But still, um, you know, Lupi looked a lot better against Dern than Angela Hill did in that fight. Just some MMA math there, but... Um, after that fight, she bounced back with the victory over Tisha Torres, uh, the victory over Jillian Robertson's an underrated win. I just, I like the youth that Richie has. And I think that eventually Hill has to hit a hill at the age that she's at. So give me Tabitha Richie to win a decision here. I think that she secures a couple of takedowns that may be the difference in the fight. Pick them odds. I don't give you a pick with a lot of confidence, but I, I like being on the Richie side. I'm going to say Angela Hill can't keep going out there and just doing what she's doing as she creeps into her forties. I'm sorry. And that takes us to the main event, Jared Cannonier jumping right back into the cage. Uh, another older fighter. We talked about a, quite a few older fighters, right? Magny Hill. Cannonier is 40 years old, and he was just in the cage 
recently against Nazardine Amavov. That was a great fight for us. We cashed in on, on, on Imavov. Excuse me, I have to come Amavov, but Nazardine Imavov. We capitalized there. It was a nice official play that we cashed on a, on a very even line in a main event spot. I love those kind of fights uh, to target. And Cannonier slowed down in that fight, okay? I mean, there's no question about it. He slowed down and was eventually finished there in the fourth round. People were arguing about the stoppage. I understand a little bit, but uh, Imavov was winning that fight. He was taking that fight over. He was going to win that fight. Don't make any mistake over analyzing that. Cannonier, you're starting to see the age reflect uh, Cannonier's performances, in my opinion. At least you're going to start to see that more and more. I know he had two victories before that, but I thought that he lost a Strickland fight, and he should arguably be one and three in his last four fights. Uh, I'll give him credit that they're all high-level fights. Vittori and Adesanya as well. The Adesanya fight, he completely froze up. Wanted nothing to do with fighting uh, a real fight to try to become the UFC champion of the world. Like you saw uh, Drakus Duplessis do, right? Duplessis willing to actually go to war. That's the difference in heart of a fighter like Cannonier and Duplessis. I'm sorry, it is what it is. He froze up in that fight. We have to remember that. Now, I'm not saying Cannonier isn't still a warrior. He's had plenty of performances where he's went out there and showed up. But um, I think that he's starting to really uh, tail off as far as his career is going. And on the other hand, you have uh, Kayo Bahailo, who's 30 years old. Kayo Bahailo, uh, that last name is another tricky one there, but opened up as a minus 160. He's now a minus 225. A lot of actions coming in on him, and I think it's all warranted. Uh, not only does he have a major grappling advantage, I think that his striking, even though he doesn't have a lot of success and show us a lot there, you see how, how light he is with that karate-type st stance, and uh, he's not easy to be hit. And I think that he just out-volumes Kenanier or just moves out of harm's way from the big knockout shot. And we'll, we'll win this fight. I think he'll win this fight. And the main thing will be the cardio going to the later rounds. I think he will have success getting this fight down to the mat. I think that Kyle is a really good fighter. So, um, I mean, I, I really do. I think Kyle is just a really good fighter uh, in his own right. He has a little bit of a different style than, than a lot of the other fighters that you see. But uh, high fight IQ doesn't put himself in a lot of danger. High level grappler. And uh, just not big time power in his hands. But he, like I said, he makes his style work. And you got to bank on the younger fighter here, in my opinion, the more prime fighter. Uh, he's coming off some impressive victories. Uh, just went out there, defeated uh, Paul Craig. Uh, got the the finish there in the second round. Looked very good in that fight. Uh, before that, uh, finished, um, uh, excuse me, no, decisioned Magomedov. And then also submitted Oleg Seyshak. But he's just, he's been looking good in there. And I just, I don't think that an old 40-year-old cannoneer is going to stop uh, the momentum that Kyle has been bringing into the cage. So that, that's how I see the fight playing out. I think that Kayo can even... Nah, I'm going to say Kayo wins a decision. I'm going to say this fight actually goes the long haul, but Kyle is just up round and round, and uh, he's not minus 225, 230. That line's got up there, but it is what it is. You want it to be on that line earlier, um, but Kayo is the way that you would go still. I don't see a lot of value on Cannon here. I just I don't think he wins the fight. All right, guys, that's going to wrap this card up. Uh, as you guys notice, if you're a frequent watcher of my show, I, I really was just banging these predictions out. It was a lot quicker than I normally am. Uh, let me know what you guys think about that. I mean, I, I definitely want to go more in depth in the future, but this is a, a video that I wanted to get up. I'm running a little late with it, but let me know if you like these these quicker type picks. Maybe I'll do a little bit of a mixture. Maybe I'll try not to dive uh, as much into each fight as I normally do. I know sometimes I'm talking six, seven minutes about some of those fights. Let me know how long you guys would like. If you can, comment below. Let me know how long you would like the time frame for each fight to be. Do you like it more around like the three to four minute? Do you like it real quick, two minutes? I'm just curious if you can give me some feedback there. Uh, please like this video. Let me know you, you guys like what's coming at you guys. Hope you guys catch on that free play on DDP that I posted here on the channel. And um, what else can we say? That's it, man. I'm not going to give you any deep parting words. Signing out, Teller. The Teller. The Teller. The Teller. The teller.